G'day, Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series, and welcome to another episode of Landy Talk. Here today, we've got another intrepid adventurer on the show. This is someone who has travelled to some of the remoter parts and the more forgotten parts of Australia, and has been bringing these parts of Australia to life through the power of film. He has, in my mind, one of the best YouTube channels out there on the YouTube platform and is a channel that I recommend any off-road going enthusiast to subscribe to. This is none other than Brett from Roaming the Outback. If you want to find out more about Brett's adventures and obviously find out about his past adventures and what big plans he has for the future, then you know what to do. Stay tuned. Thanks again for joining us, Brett. And uh, for the viewers, this is the second time that we've done this. Sadly, we had some uh, technical issues on the uh, the first time, but um, second time lucky, we could say. But uh, thanks again for making the time, Brett, and making the effort to uh, sit down with us and have a bit of a chat, because I know there's a lot of our subscribers that are just going to absolutely love uh, your channel. So I guess before we get started, Brett, would you mind sort of filling people in on what Roaming the Outback's all about and sort of how it came about for you? Cool, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, Roaming the Outback. I started making films probably back around, was it oh, 2002 when I got my first video camera and just sort of took off there as a hobby filmmaker. I kept making films, you know, burning them to DVD, sharing them to friends and family who'd actually watch them. <laughs> And then uh, while I was living up in Cape York, one day I discovered uh, a thing called YouTube. And I'd, I'd never heard of it before. I thought, wow, I can actually upload videos and share them to the world and I can actually have an audience. I rang my friends and asked them, hey guys, you heard about this, this thing called YouTube? And like, yeah, man, it's been around like two years. And I'm like, ah, oh. because <laughs> I was living you know, in Cape York, so I had little news about what was going on in the world. Um, but that sort of set me off on, on beginning to share my films and starting a channel. I never thought I'd get anywhere with it. It was just, I just kept doing my hobby of making films and sharing my adventures. I uh, started off with like a, a three-week solo trip from Cairns to the tip of Cape York, and that was sort of my first real film I, I produced wow. for an online audience. Wow. Um, and from there, over the last, last, I don't know, 2008 was when that sort of happened. What's that, 14-something years? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I've just kept growing and growing, and I've developed my, my skill sets and upgraded my camera gear. And sort of just about sharing um, slow travel through the outback in the bush. Um, more about nature, because as a former park ranger, I have that more passion of, of conservation and wildlife. So I bring that more into my, my filmmaking than just going hardcore with the trucks and spinning tires and, and the tracks and all that kind of thing that a lot of other channels do, whereas I'm just not really interested. I see my car as more of a tool to get me into these places. So I'm not there to, to destroy or rip it up. I just want to cruise around and um, yeah, just and just enjoy life in that place, and I slow so style so I can take it all in. And um, oh, yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's just and growing, they've growing real, so. They've got a real sort of, I guess, Malcolm Douglas, Les, Les Hidden sort of style to it. Like with your latest, latest video, there was a bit of everything in there. There was um, Bush Tucker, there was a bit of the, the history of the area, and um, also the, you know, the uh, species in the area too, that, you know, the cane toad and how. A lot of the, uh, I think the ravens are flipping them over and eating them from the, um, I guess the inside out almost, which yep. is quite fascinating, you know. So that gives people a bit of the inside knowledge, and that yeah. too. But so was it your, I guess, exposure to being a park ranger that sort of helped you to pursue it further, or was it always a passion for nature that sort of got you in interested in it to begin with? I think it was always a passion just for nature, like loved going camping as a kid and fossil king and um, just hunting around creeks, looking for fish, and, you know, turtle, just seeing what was in there, just exploring. And somehow I've managed to sort of 
add camera gear and <laughs> try and film myself doing all those things as well, which adds a, a bit of a difficult dynamic as a one man show trying to you know, set up shots and reverse out of the shot, drive through the shot, reverse back, get the camera set up the next shot. So um, it's a fair bit of labor intensive to, to get it to this kind of standard I've sort of set for myself, uh, which has sort of paid off well with getting it onto a wider audience and onto TV and um, other online networks now. So it's, it's, yeah, it's been a good, good experience though. And when, when I look back and see the, the finished footage, I, I can actually relive the experience because my mind can't remember so much because I don't have anyone else to bounce the ideas off or memories off. Yeah. Um, solo travel. So all I have is my memory and that sense of fade pretty quickly. So <laughs> now and again, I'll, I'll pull out another, another one of my, my films and rewatch it. And like, Oh yeah, I remember that. And I see that. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of like a, um, what do you call it? A, a legacy of my life that I can share on, onwards. Oh, definitely. No, it's fantastic. It's almost like a, a video diary, I guess you could say, in some regards. Mm. Mm. And getting it onto television, that's quite interesting. How, how did that come about, Brett? I just had one of the, um, I guess, the head gurus at, at, at um, Channel 31 in Melbourne, Geelong, on the community television, reach out to me, said they loved my, my films and would love to get them onto um, community TV. So we just wrote up a little contract and we started re-editing everything for, for online broadcast and I've had two seasons now um, broadcast and had a lot of really good positive feedback and it's brought on a whole bunch of new subscribers um, based in Australia to, to my YouTube channel as well. That's fantastic. So it keeps, just keep, keeps spreading the news and I've got a new online broadcaster from Bundaberg who started their own online sort of TV channel um, and I'm now broadcast on there as well. Right. So it's good to good to get the exposure out because as you, as you would know on YouTube, unless someone types a specific thing in, they'll never find the video. It's that and people aren't really searching Pacific nas, national parks unless they're planning to go there. So a lot of my films can just disappear into to the abyss. And and the other thing is too, Brett, everyone types in land cruiser, not land rover, you know. So that's <laughs> yeah. and I guess that brings us on to the next subject. You've obviously got a very nice land rover defender. And I guess sort of what, what started you on, on that, I guess, trail of becoming a, a Land Rover enthusiast? It doesn't just happen out of nowhere. <laughs> no, it was way back to when I was a kid. I think um, the Bush Tucker man, Les Hiddens, watching his film on TV yep. way back in the day, um, yep. just seeing that Land Rover just the most wild sort of places. Uh, and that's somehow just sunk into my subconscious mind as, a, as like a four-wheel drive that maybe someday I'd like to own. And I think Malcolm Douglas too had a had a uh, he had a V8 uh, county, oh, county for a while there as well for yeah. some of his films. Yeah. Um, so when, if, when I, my first car was a Mini, but when I started wanting to actually you know find something I could actually go a bit further out from Brisbane in, um, the Defender just kept appearing around the town. I think that's that's the car for me. And yeah. I sort of started searching around for one. And the second car I looked at, I ended up just buying. Like this is it. <laughs> I want it. Um, it was a good thing too, because within three weeks after that, I got offered a job on Cape York as a ranger. And then three weeks after that, I was on Cape York. Wow. Um, with a four-wheel drive I just purchased, had no four-wheel driving experience whatsoever. And I'm heading to Cape York. So it was a very fast learning curve. <laughs> um, yeah, it just seemed to be serendipity. Everything sort of come together at that time for me to actually take, to, to accept that dream job I'd always wanted. Yeah, yeah. Um, but other than that, there's probably other reasons. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a big event. And he lost it a few times and could have, you know, crashed and burned on the side of the road. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> a few learning experiences about how to, how to drive on uh, corrugated tracks and, um, you know, how to, how to re regain control when it hit massive potholes at 100 k's an hour and get flung to the other side of the road. I'm teetering on those edges where on Cape York, you know, like the road's lifted up like a meter or two off the side. So I'm teetering yep. on that edge, like nearly, nearly about to go <laughs> off and trying to pull it back again. and um, but yeah, I was young and I didn't know as much as I do now. I don't have many K's um, experience. Um, but yes, yeah, somehow just Defender. I, I wish I had learned more about Defenders before I bought one because I didn't realise you know, how many issues would, would pop up with Land River ownership. And yep. I just thought they were like a really tough, hardcore truck and just, yeah, I want to be like Bush Tucker Man. But once you actually own one, it's like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> labour of love. Stops. It is. Yeah, labour of love. Yeah, it's... Yeah. it's, it's um, every month you got to give it some love and care just to keep it purring along but on the, on the plus side I, I know my truck now i bought it 2006 and what's that um 16 years or something wow. i had it yeah so yeah, i yeah. know 
pretty much know everything on the track now. I've pulled most things off and I can see it in my, visualize it in my mind when something goes wrong. What mm. could this be? What, what wires go where? Yeah. So I'm plus side way in the middle of nowhere. As you've seen from many of my films, I push mechanics. So I can fix it on the side of the road and um, typical Land Rover, it breaks down a lot, but you can fix it. It's, it's usually just something minor. Um, you can jerry rig something to get it going. It's, it's just a basic. You know, my one's my one's pre electro pre electronic, so it's very basic, and I can have the ability to just keep it going. Um, so I'm least lucky in that regard. Well, well, that's the thing. Like a, I, I always say jokingly that a Land Cruiser breaks down because you can't get it going again. But a Land Rover just stops. It has a rest, and you can always get it going again. And you've yeah. particularly on your channel, Brett. You've got the Land Rover out of some pretty pretty interesting situations. I think there was one where you were in the, was it the corner country? Cameron's corner way? And yes. was it a, was something to do, I think with the pump or the can? There was a couple of screws that came loose and you ended yeah, up having the, um, to fashion a few bits to get it going again. Yeah, a few, a few injection pump. I just had one fitted a couple of months beforehand and two of the bolts that hold the timing thing onto the, the fuel injection pump had been injected out, they ratted off and started screeching and grinding around inside and I had to just cut up some new bolts for it and put it all back together. Uh, it took a while to figure out what it was because it was such a unique screaming grinding sound. I thought that something broken inside and I was about to be like stranded there and <laughs> I kept on <laughs> kept on looking and my, my typical like I don't give up I just keep thinking yep. through my mind and looking through the workshop manual and keep looking for something and I found it and um, I think a lot of people who have a car they don't understand how it works would, would have mm -hmm. just stopped and called for help and got you know trucked out. Um, yeah. At least I have the ability. I can, <laughs> yeah, can yeah, go through my mind and just have that mechanical skills. Thanks to you know the, um, all the years of the park range, plus my years my dad sort of taught me yeah. uh, rebuilding yeah. my mini. Yeah, so that gave me a lot of experience. Oh yeah, well you know Land Rovers have been turning the average Joe into mechanics for over seventy years, pretty much. So yeah. yeah, yeah, and so I guess since we're talking about the Defender, what what year is the Defender that you've got, Brett? That's the 1993 200 TDI uh, 110 wagon. Oh, so nice, it's, nice. It's, um, yeah, it's the last last 200 TDI before the 300 TDI came out in 1994. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, as far as I know with the 200 TDI, like, they're a fantastic engine, but there's a few things you've got to watch out for. Have you had to modify it a little bit just to make it a bit more reliable or a bit more dependable? Um, not so much the engine. I found that reasonably good. You just got to keep on the oil changes and make sure that timing belt gets changed every something like 50 or 60,000 just as preventative. Because yep. I think the early ones came out, they were starting to shred their belts way, way too early. Something that wasn't quite right. Yeah. Um, so I just keep on top of that. Um, you don't have a great deal of power. I think I put mine on a dyno tune and it's like 70 horsepower at the wheels. Oh, um, okay. so by the time it sort of runs down from the engine down to the, to the wheels, it's you know, it's, but it gets me around. It probably helps with my slow travel, and I yep. have to think rather than using lots of revs and, and power to get me out of situations. I got to think and, and you know, use use my tires to my advantage, lower the pressures where I need to, and um, set my lines. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the good but thing other, about otherwise, that, it's oh, you you can't really just, otherwise any axles when you're uh, you haven't got much power. All the power has to go down to the ground through the tires. Hmm which is yeah. an advantage. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I still upgraded, you know, various parts and pieces just to um, get rid of some of those engineered in um, issues like, like the, the half shafts and the ten spline um, and some of the, the front diffs that tend to break. So I've done a bit of work on just getting rid of those sort of areas that and, and upgrading to aftermarket parts. So I think I've made a quite reliable truck overall. It's usually things that do break it as minor. Like I mm. think I think I've set myself up pretty good otherwise. And so I guess walking walking through the the Land Rover, what what are the key sort of modifications that you've done to it over the years? There, yeah. there must be a long long list, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, we'll start with like the engine. All I did really there was just upgrade to a, a Ali Sport intercooler, so it gave me like another ten horsepower. Oh. Um, that that was really noticeable. Um, just the cooling that that air coming in, um, and then after that. Front and rear axles have been upgraded to the maxi drive half shafts. They're like two times the strength. Um, uh, Detroit True Track limited slip diffs. So I've got, oh, yeah. like, instead of an open diff, when, when one wheel has a bit of traction, it will keep the other wheel um, going. 
um, so it doesn't just keep spinning. So that really helps me in, in sand. I found quite quite well um, for the gearbox. The transfer case and engine have all been rebuilt, um, just just for reliability and various issues over, over the years. So I just spit the bullet and, and um, yeah, for for rebuilding those. So I'm proud to have a brand new drive line. Um, I kept almost like a lot of people that like to modify the suspension, but I just kept it as standard um, Land Rover heavy duty yeah. um, springs. So they're like, I can easily find them in any any place I need to order. I don't need to get custom made springs and everything. It's just straight Land Rover, put them in. And that, that does fine for me with Coney Raid 90 shocks. So I've got like a nice reservoir there to, uh, that can take the pounding from hundreds of kilometers of, of corrugations. And then inside is probably where most of the the fun stuff was where I rebuilt all the dash and have all my nice gauges and switches and, and oh, um, yes. all, the, all the feedback things. I can check temperatures in multiple places so I can get multiple references and get early warning before something actually goes wrong. So I know that if the fan belt is like snapped or if um, the coolant starting to overheat, the oil's getting low or whatever, there's something there that can that can give me a warning. Because yeah. yeah. as you know, it's um, you tend to tend to blank blank out while driving long kilometers, and sometimes I forget like to scan those gauges. But I've got alarms that go off, and you know, pull me back <laughs> into into um, the present and see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, then all like dual batteries and and uh, various lighting all around for security. And the biggest thing was like my Molgo pop top conversion, so I now have a, a proper yeah. bed, double bed upstairs. I can lift that up. Uh, it takes like thirty seconds to set up camp. And then the, the bed platform pushes up, so I've got a, a room inside to, to get dressed and eat inside when it's bad outside, when it's like wow. bad weather, which is like life changing for that. And that was my, my pretty much my last real mod that I've done. And that was like the dream sort of car is now complete as far as I sort of see it. It's yeah. all those like 16 years of dreaming and, and watching videos and collecting thousands and thousands of Land Rover pictures and get ideas and pulling on the parts that I wanted and testing and, um, you know. Keep keep rebuilding the inside different, different ways each each time I learn some new experience like modify, um, which is another great thing that you can you can just rip, thing, rip everything out just to basic stuff inside and you know, it's it's fully customizable whatever you want to do just unbolt it get a new part fabricated and put it all back together. And, and um, that's so got, and that's the great thing about them you just keep well basically reinventing them every few years you know like mm, you, yes as the needs change for, yeah. You've got the pop top, you've got your perfect setup now. Because I think it must have been what a good well, it would have been what 10 years or so that you spent just with a mattress in the back, Brett. And that was um, pretty no, that was probably like four years. I think I did that in yep. like a year before rebuilt re, before I set off my first trip around Australia in 2015. I lived in that for like the first three trips around Australia. So I probably did like 20, 22 months or something sleeping just in a little crawl space, but it, it got me around Australia and it, it was very cheap to make. So it, it did its job, but um, moving forward into like a more um, user-friendly experience, it's it's the pop tops the way to go. They actually have a, a real life and eat, eat food properly, you know, stay, sitting upright. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in my bed trying to hide from the cold or the, the rain outside. <laughs> And the other thing is, too, it must be nice, particularly where the places that you travel to, just getting that escape from the the flies. You know, you can sit in there, you can do a bit of editing if you want to, and hmm. you know, obviously edit a few photos and just even just relax. I guess also. Yeah, yeah, it's really good now. It's just yeah, I can't sort of set up and have the editing space. Whereas in the past, I'd try and edit in a, in a tent beside the truck, and I was like hunched over in the tent with a little desk in there. And, uh, oh. I still got to do a little more work with modifying how the interior goes but i think um i sort of kind of see my car is finished now i don't remember it keeps throwing money at it I just i think from now on it's just going to be maintaining it and um, whatever more travels i get to do i'll just enjoy it as it is yeah and so i guess um since we've been sort of touching on trips what what are sort of the iconic trips that you think you've done brett and what are the iconic ones that people should watch and follow on your channel um, I did my first trip around Australia in 2015. That worked out nearly 10 months long. Yeah. Um, I ended up sort of doing the weird thing and, and heading south first in, in coming up towards winter. So I'd, further south I went and colder and colder it was and um, the parks were all like virtually empty. So I had all this beautiful national parks to myself. But I wasn't <laughs> prepared either because as a Queenslander, I'd never experienced such cold and I didn't have quite the, the gear um, to keep, keep me warm enough. So I sort of had <laughs> a few... Um, extra you know two or three sleeping bags together and multiple jackets um but yeah headed south and uh, all the way down like 
pretty much hug the coastline with a few trips inland to do the more remoter parks. Um, then reach Sejuna in South Australia and just headed up straight north through the cent, you know, Northern Territory country and before I hit Darwin and um, then back across again. But I think um, in all that, that was like the first, because in my mind, I, I still saw Australia as like uh, the way Malcolm Douglas and Bush Tucker Man showed it back in the day. But Australia's changed in those 20 or 30 years since I was a kid. Oh, it's, no, yeah. it's no longer a remote wilderness. It's, it's bitumen highway everywhere with easy access. Uh, most of the national parks have really well graded tracks and signage everywhere. Um, and then the GPS really helps a lot. Like I, can, I can just drive without really having to know where I am because every, every street and, and trail is on the GPS mapped out. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's sort of opened my eyes and I realized, wow, you know, I'm glad I'm doing it now, not waiting till I'm retired. I know oh, in 30 yeah. years' time because there, there won't be any remote places, there won't be any real adventure. Um, every, every park will have like a kiosk and, you know, <laughs> and oh, yeah. Get, yeah, yeah. buy whatever you want, little ice creams and stuff. Um, <laughs> Take so, a coach in, you know? Yeah, take a coach. It's, yep. it's changing very quickly. So, mm. um, but I, I really liked when I hit Gook's track. I think that's one track everyone should do when you hit South Australia, head up from Sejuna just straight up. Um, it's only like a two to two a day track or so, but if you take it slow, it's like a mini Simpson Desert. That's probably one of my favorite, um, enjoy, most enjoyable tracks. And then also uh, Ruby Gap National Park in Northern Territory. That sort of oh, comes yeah. to mind as a really nice, nice little spot with all the the garnets in, in the in the sand. Yeah. Um, again, I was there on my own, so I had this beautiful, big, you know, gorge either side and this water hole, which is like the last sort of water for the for the dry season, and just nice to swim in there free. And <laughs> it's just oh, um, perfect, perfect. Yeah. And then yeah, I, I do love like the outback Queensland areas lately. Carowinia, that's like a really nice big park. You can spend a couple of weeks there easy. I think I think I did yeah twelve or thirteen days there. It's oh, really nice. slow just to really enjoy it all in. Mm. And, and Sturt National Park was one of the last parks I visited um, in 2019, like that, that third trip. And that was like really eye opener just to see the vast distances of just um, gibber and, and red red dust. Uh, and then heading into that red dune sand country around the Cameron Corner. And again, nice and quiet because usually the places I go, there's no one around. So I, can I know. And that, that's one of the great in. things about it. You can. Um... You can sort of experience that wilderness, but you're still not too far away from civilization, you know, particularly mm. Cameron's Corner. Yeah. So I guess uh, moving on, you're preparing at the moment to potentially hit the road down the track, Brett. Uh, where, where do you think that might take you? Um, I still have plans to fill in all the gaps that I missed out in the last three trips. Um, it just depends on, depending on the world situation, what's going on um, at that time. Uh, I'd, I'd like to head out straight west and fill in the gaps of uh, Diamantina National Park way out here and way out back Queensland uh, do the Simpson Desert Crossing as well yep. it's been on my to-do to -do list for three times and each time I just haven't got the chance to get there uh, and then I'll probably um, what's it thinking? Um, there's another little park out there I did a couple of days I can't remember the name um, do that and then basically head up to uh, Lawn Hill do Jamala. Oh yes, yep, yep. That, that's sort of little chunks I need to fit in first to get yep. Queensland and that sort of outback country complete in my mind. Yep, yep. Uh, and then from there I'll start probably heading back towards Northern Territory and filling in some of the, the, the gaps there. Oh, I'll, gotcha. Each each of my three trips I keep visualizing I'm going to do so much, but then when it comes to it, I just don't get there because I, I spend too long in one spot and just enjoy <laughs> it. I don't, you know, I don't, not in any rush to keep racing off, and then the filming takes so long to. You know, to move a certain number of k's a day, I got to keep stopping and reversing and do that, do the film work. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any regrets though in, in my travels. There's no place I feel like I need to go back to and revisit because I, did, I didn't have enough time. I spent the time I needed until I felt like I'm, I've done it, I've seen everything I need to see, I visited all the, the highlights. And, um, so at least, at least I have that. And I can just um, aim for, aim towards the way in the future. Western Australia, which I haven't touched yet. It's oh. haven't crossed haven't crossed that border. So from right here on other travelers, it's at least 12 months minimum just to see that. You know, so I'm sure that would take me two years. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I easy, Brett. Easy. And the thing I love about your channel, Brett, is it's about the journey. It's not about the destination. You know, you take your time to enjoy it, as you've just said, and that's really how it should be. We spend, you know, so much money and so much time preparing these vehicles to go to these destinations. 
and we spend more time on the journey to get there that people are focused on the destination itself. So if you spend two years in WA, you, you're going to absolutely love it, I think. It'd be great. Yeah. 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 So I just don't, don't want to sort of cross that border until like I'm fully ready because once I cross, I probably won't be coming back. You said for two <laughs> years, you know, so it's just oh, you know, yeah. say goodbye to all the family and friends. Like, yep, I'm gone. See yep. you in two years once they yep. make it out of there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's oh. why I keep focusing. Just keep focusing on the east, filling all the gaps, and then when that's all done, I'm like, yep, I'm done. Just Western Australia disappear. Yep. yep. No, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So um, I guess if people want to know more about Roaming the Outback, how can they find out about it, Brett? Uh, head to my website, roamingtheoutback.com. That's my main travel blog, uh, as well as links to some of the other. I've got a YouTube channel. Also, I'm on Odyssey now. It's a, it's like a backup for my YouTube channel should ever be deplatformed. I've got a yeah. uh, side, side thing there. Uh, and that's sort of like the main I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, kind of, but I don't, I don't use those as much. But yeah. you head to that Roaming the Outback website first, and from there you can sort of branch off and see whatever you want, you want to see, whether it's videos or blogs, or photos. Yep. And this um, you mentioned earlier in the video about uh, Bundaberg, an uh, online streaming service there or television station. Um, can yep. people view your exploits there too? Yep, yep. They have an online platform. Um, can't remember the name of it though. It's, it's sort of brand new and they're just starting to get a bunch of Australian creators and content into that oh, Bundaberg okay. region because um, they, like, like they sort of say, that there's so much like a foreign media coming in and, and sort of losing that Australian way. And it's just one place where they can, Australians can see other Australians enjoying our country. Yep, yep, um, yep. Oh, we'll, we'll try and yep. find a link and put it in the description box down below and they can follow you there too, Brett. Yep, yep, I'll forward that on to you. Yeah, no worries. Well, look, um, thank you so much for making the time once again, Brett. And I know everyone's going to really enjoy this video and um, I'm sure you'll get a few more followers on your channel and that too. But I think we'll be chatting again as always, Brett, down the track and uh, best of luck with your adventures. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. No worries. We'll catch you later. All right. See you later.